our sister Jackie is home with the Lord and um, safe and sound. Um, today, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, uh, our summer series, uh, identifying or weathering the storms uh, of cultural lies and and that's been our focus uh, this entire worship service, standing on promises, and, and now leading up to Ecclesiastes. And the title of this sermon, um, Pleasure is a Gift, Not a God. Pleasure is a Gift, Not a God. I want to read a few passages of God's Word, of, of Ecclesiastes to you, God's Word, um, and then get on with prayer and share what the Lord has laid on my heart. And, uh, but first of all, does everyone have a photocopy of uh, something? You got it? it? It came with your worship folder. And uh, there are some, there's quite a bit there, but we'll, uh, we'll make our way through that. I'll, I'll show you what that's for in a minute. Look with me at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. God's word says, I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. Which is why I wore this shirt today. This shirt does not communicate work. It communicates pleasure. I've never worn this, but uh, it serves the purpose. Um, you look at this, and I wore it in Hawaii uh, a few years ago, and you know, you just, you just want to chill out and relax and uh, take it easy. Solomon, in his, I believe, in his old age, as he is observing life, and from God's point of view of the way it looks like under the sun, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? Keep that in mind as you now turn to chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Chapter 11, 1 through 4. As Solomon comes to the end of his, his treatise, his poetic essay on what is the ultimate purpose and meaning of life. In other words, what he's attempting to do here is express a worldview, and everyone has one, a worldview as God sees things. Chapter 11, verse 1 says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. At least these two verses, what we know for sure, says this. Um, you do your best. Uh, hopefully things will turn out well. But you just never know when disaster is going to break loose on your life. You can't foresee it. There it is. It's in your face. Three days, I think it was three or four days, before we went to West Virginia, and I could have shared this on Sunday morning, uh, the previous Sunday that I was that I was here, and then we left in the, in the afternoon. Uh, we almost stayed home. The reason why is because my dad called me and says we're taking your mom to the emergency room. Uh, my mom had hip surgery two years ago, had hip replacement surgery, her right hip, and uh, it popped out, and she's on the floor, literally passing out from the pain. Now rushing her to the hospital. And uh, we thought the trip would be over, and there it was. And my mom called and said, no, they released her and sent her home. They put her in a, in a cast-type thing to keep it straight, and now she's just supposed to just sit at the house, and are we staying home here? Are we not going to West Virginia? I'm not going to be able to see my dad. Mom says, come on, I want to see you, my family. We go there, we have the Truman reunion, we get through the week, mom hobbles around, and then the Truman reunion is, is, is starting, and the oldest person, everyone else is dead, from Shirley, Aunt Shirley up, she's 78. She gets into Somersville, 
stops off at my one of my cousins. Uh, he owns a, an antique shop, and sh she starts vomiting, and she passes out. She comes to, and her whole side is drawn, and she can't move, and she's listless, and they call the ambulance. She passes out again. She com and comes to and just literally can't, and can't speak, and they rush her to the hospital. Oh, she's had a stroke, and the hours go by. Oh, no, she hasn't had a stroke. Oh, we don't know what in the world happened. You're discharged. And that settles on our family reunion. Uh, it's hard to enjoy. Just when you thought this is going to be a great time, you, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Just when you thought this is going to be a great time, boom. And you want to be happy. You want to have pleasure. Come, my heart. I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But this too is madness. It's a vanity to put so much stock and investment and time into pleasure because just when you thought it was just going to be a great time, so what's the point in trying to be happy? What's the point in pursuing pleasure? And at the same time, I cannot resist this urge in my heart that I really do want to have a pleasurable life. But it's almost not worth it because every time I plan something, so you try, you give it your best, you cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. That's normally the way things go. There is a certain kind of predictability and certainty to life that when you jump out of an airplane with a parachute, you'll probably land, and if you don't, you probably won't. It's the way things normally go. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't count them all, all these sayings that we have. Spread yourself a little bit of thin, thinly a little bit here. It's, this verse is used for financial investment, and it does work for that appropriately because you want to spread it out a little bit because you have no idea whether this 401k is going to go or the gold is going to do this or that. And you don't want it all in one place because if something happens, you just lost your shirt and the farm and everything. If the clouds are full of rain, verse 3, they empty themselves on the earth. I, I know what we want to say. Duh. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place the tree falls, what? <laughs> That's where it's going to lie. Facing whatever direction it fell in. He who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. The point is, if you try to outwit disaster and circumvent it, and until then, you're not going to make a move, you're not going to invest, you're not going to go to work, and you're not going to do the dishes, you're not going to do anything, because you're so afraid that disaster is going to place, take place, and you're trying to outwit disaster, you can't forget it because you'll be sitting on your rear end until the cows come home. It's just best to just get up, get going, do your best, and disaster is going to come, and you will not be able to thwart it. When he comes down to chapter 12, he says, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. You're going to get old and your body is going to quit working the way it used to work. And that's just the way it is. There'll come a day when these fingers will be too arthritic or I won't, something's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. I will not be able to play these instruments that I love to play. It's a huge pleasure for me. But one day, this pleasure is going to go away. If I live long enough, I will not be able to play instruments anymore. Isn't that incredible? And if you live long enough, 
you will not be able to enjoy the things that you are presently enjoying. That's just the way it is. So what is the point of it all? Verse 13 of chapter 12. The end of the matter. The totality of, of all that there is. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Or in the words of Francis Schaeffer, this is the mannishness of man. What a weird. This is the totality of what it means to be a human being. And as Francis Schaeffer would grip his hand like this. This is the mannishness of man. This is it. Fear God and keep his commandments. Verse 14, why? For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Let's raise a question. Is God anti-pleasure? No, he's not. And this book is full of proof that he is not anti-pleasure. He is pro-pleasure. Let's look at a recent one. Uh, chapter 9, verse 7. Here's proof that God is not anti-pleasure. Chapter 9, verse 7. Go, eat your bread in joy. And you know what I had in West Virginia? My mom's Hudson Cream Self-Rising Biscuits with fried venison steak in the morning, oh, and coffee, it's six, six, oh my goodness. Eat your bread with venison in joy. That's, that's the underlying root Hebrew nuance of that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> in joy and drink your wine with a merry heart for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white, in a poetic way, saying, Enjoy the good gifts of life. He said that in chapter 3. He said it in several times, in several ways. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Another way of just simply saying, Let your days be smooth. Carefree, in a certain sense, and healthy. There's a medicinal element in that saying. May you have good health. God speed. God be with you. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. <laughs> that he has given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Enjoy life. If you're married, in the context here, if you're married, enjoy your wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. There is a vanity to it and there's a reason why. Hang on. Verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, put your back into it. Give it everything you got. Don't wimp out in this life. Whatever you do, give it everything you've got. Don't be a chump. Don't be lazy. Don't be backward. Don't be insignificant in this life. Make a difference. Get in there. Get dirty up to your knees and give it everything you've got. There is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, in the grave. You can't learn to play a new instrument if you're six feet under. So while you're alive, get with it, man. And enjoy. Have, have, uh, have you ever been asked, hey, what are you doing this weekend? 
by someone who doesn't know the Lord. I, would, I get asked this a lot, and I got asked this again by a young man named Ben just this week. He doesn't know the Lord. He said, uh, so what you doing this weekend? And I don't think he really knows me. He doesn't understand what I do for a living. I think he does, but not really. So he says, so what are you doing this weekend? I said, well, he asked. I'm going to tell him. <laughs> so I said, well, um, Saturday, uh, I'm going to work around the house. I'm sure I'm going to be in the garden helping my wife. And I'm watching his eyes, and I'm watching his face to see if there's approval or disapproval. Look people in the face and give them an answer. Now, and you watch them. Because their, their body language will tell you whether they think you're going to have a great weekend or just an ordinary <laughs> kind of weekend. So, I still, so, so, so Saturday, I'm, uh, I'll be working around the house. I'm sure I'm going to be in the garden helping my wife. And I, and, I just, and, and I kept talking about what Saturday probably is going to unfold. And da, 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 da blah, 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 blah. And then, uh, since I like to be in my home Saturday evening, I do not like being out. Um, I need my rest. Uh, I like getting in bed uh, early on Saturday night uh, because I always get up around 5 o'clock Sunday morning. And I'm in the Word, and I'm in prayer, and I t I'm telling Ben, I, I, I'm, so I'm going to be in the Word early Sunday morning, in God's Word, reading it, and I'm going to be praying and thinking about the day, and, uh, and then I'm going to preach and teach God's Word and spend time with God's people. And then, uh, Sunday afternoon, I'm going to go home and take a nap, and then I'm going to uh, go spend some time with my family and my grandsons, and then uh, spend some more time with Cheryl, my wife, and maybe we'll sit down and we'll watch a good movie, and then I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> His response, and I'm looking at him, I'm looking at him, and you can tell, man, get a life, Ivan. <laughs> get a life. And he's going, push the button, get off the stage. This is boring. This is ordinary. There is nothing exciting about this. And he's, his response was, oh. And he goes back to work. <clears throat> Boring. Just ordinary. You know what? When you, when you read the book of Ecclesiastes and you start thinking about uh, life under the sun as the Lord is leading Solomon in his old age to, to reflect upon uh, the meaning of life. Uh, Solomon is helping us to understand that the meaning of life is not in pleasure, though it is an irresistible impulse in us that God has made in us to pursue pleasure, but yet pleasure is, the pursuit of pleasure is not sturdy enough to stand on it. It will not survive. It will not survive at all. You're going to have disaster every single day, and the big picture of this is trying to understand how to have a biblical worldview of the world that you live in, and especially when it comes to the subject of pleasure. Maintaining a biblical worldview regarding pleasure is and always will be a spiritual discipline for your life. It always will be. You cannot slack up on this. And when I use the word worldview, which everyone has one, everyone on the, on the planet has a worldview, what I mean to say, fundamentally say is who am I how did I get here and and what is the meaning of pleasure and enjoyment in this life what's its purpose or does it even have a purpose the in the Hebrew the Kohalith where we get to translate the Ecclesiastes or chapter 1 verse 1 the preacher has something to say about you and the world you live in, and God is at the very center of it all, not pleasure, though we are seeking pleasure. If God is not the center of your life and he your ultimate pleasure, 
Solomon is wanting to say in no uncertain terms that your life, that my life, is meaningless and your view and my view of the world that we live in is meaningless and it will be like, if pleasure is your God, it will be like trying to grab hold of wind. It is elusive. You will, be not, you will not be able to harness pleasure as ultimate meaning in your life because disaster is coming. And if, even if you're able to buy your way out of disasters in this life, there is coming a day you're going to get old and you're going to die. You're going down. And it probably won't be pretty. Life will feel extraordinarily vain and empty if you make pleasure ultimate. It will leave you frustrated and will cause you to be a bitter cynic in this life. Uh, it should not come as a surprise then that everyone around you who does not know the Lord and his gospel will have an influence upon you that is ultimately meaningless. Remembering at the same time, uh, they are searching for meaning and purpose. I know for a fact Ben asked that question because he is considering in his mind what is a meaningful life. He is trying to figure out what is the meaning and purpose of life. And as far as he understands, it's having a great weekend. And he's got an idea in his mind what a great weekend is. Everyone has an idea of what a great weekend is. And you can read Parade Magazine. You can go online. And what is a perfect Sunday? And I've heard answers and read answers. Oh, it's getting up in the morning and then having waffles. And then going for a horseback ride and then taking a nap, and then spending time with friends in the afternoon, and then going to a great show or a party at night. That's it. You know how easily it is to have your weekend ruined? The waffles get burned. The horse dies. <laughs> your friends are mad at you. You can't do the party because the electricity is shut off. Mike Horton's essay, which you have a copy of, is on living the ordinary Christian life. And this comes out of August's issue of Table Talk. R.C. Sproul called me and he told me, if you'll do this, I'll send you $100 for free advertisement. No, I'm just kidding. So. <laughs> But this is an outstanding, this, this month's issue is outstanding. The title is called The Ordinary Christian Life. The whole booklet is, 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 is essays, small brief uh, exhortations on the ordinary life, like um, The Ordinary Christian Life by Mike Horton, Ordinary Christian Work by Tim Chalice. Excellent essay on ordinary work, just work, vocation. Another one, The Ordinary Christian Family by Ted Tripp. And then another one, The Ordinary Christian Church. We are in an ordinary Christian church, and I love it, by Sean Lucas. And then another one, The Ordinary Christian Pastor. I'm an ordinary Christian pastor by Eric Raymond. But Mike Horton, his essay on uh, The Ordinary uh, Christian Life. I want to read some of it to you. Um, he's hit on something very subtle, uh, and that is in our culture. Our culture is constantly, our culture is constantly offering something spectacular in order to have meaning in life. A, a, a better weekend, a greater weekend than the last one. As as if as if ha, you are only meaningful if you are if you are extraordinary. If you're not extraordinary, and if this weekend is not more extraordinary than the last weekend, then your life is pointless. Our culture communicates that in hundreds of ways. And it affects the church. It affects me. It affects you. He opens up this essay, Mike Horton does, with words like radical, epic, Revolutionary, transformative, impactful, 
life-changing, ultimate, extreme, awesome, emergent, alternative, innovative, on the edge, the next big thing, explosive breakthrough. You can probably add to the list of modifiers that have become, ironically, part of the ordinary conversations in society and in today's church. Most of us have heard expressions like these so often that they become background noise. Although we might be a little jaded by the ads, we're eager to take things to a whole new level. Ordinary has to be one of the loneliest words in our vocabulary today. Who wants a bumper sticker that announces to the neighborhood, my child is an ordinary student at Bubbling Brook Elementary? Who wants to be that ordinary person who lives in an ordinary town, is a member of an ordinary church, has ordinary friends, and works an ordinary job? Our life has to count. We have to leave our mark, have a legacy, and make a difference. We need to be radical disciples, taking our faith to a whole new level. And all of this should be something that can be managed, measured, and maintained. We have to live up to our Facebook profile. And yet I sense, says Mike Horton, a growing restlessness with this restlessness. Some have grown tired of the constant calls to radical change through new and improved schemes. They are less sure they want to jump on the next bandwagon or blaze new paths to greatness. Rod Dreher observes, everydayness is my problem. It's easy to think about what you would do in wartime or if a hurricane blows through, or if you spent a month in Paris, or if your guy wins the election, or if you won the lottery, or bought that thing you really wanted, it's a lot more difficult to figure out how you're going to get through today without despair. Man, that is so true. In his book about his sister, The Little Way of Ruthie Lemming, Dreyer signals a growing sense of weariness with the cult of extraordinariness. And he goes on to describe what he believes is part, part of the reason why we are where we are in our culture. Because of time, we want to skip down, so you have to flip the page now. He talks about how Finney. Charles Finney got started affecting the church with this idea that we have to have more and more extraordinariness in the church or you are a meaningless church. Really? You mean I just can't do the dishes and try to get through the day without screaming and yelling and And it'll be okay with the Lord? Can't I enjoy my food and dwell with the, my, the wife of my youth and, and uh, enjoy a good biscuit and, and uh, mow the lawn and take a good nap and go to bed? I mean, is, is that not? No, that's not enough. And he talks about that. And I'm going to skip down to it. Toward the end of his ministry, the last full paragraph, far left, toward the end of his, Charles Finney's ministry, as he considered the condition of many who had experienced his revivals, Finney himself wondered if this endless craving for ever greater experiences might lead to spiritual exhaustion. His worries were well founded. The area where Finney's revivals were especially dominant is now referred to by historians as the burned over district, a seedbed of both disillusionment and the proliferation of esoteric sects, this has been the vicious cycle of evangelical revivalism ever since. A pendulum swinging between enthusiasm and disillusionment rather than steady maturation in Christ through participation in the ordinary life of the covenant community. That's right. Humdrum is okay. It really is. If gradual growth in Christ is exchanged for a radical experience, it is not surprising that many begin looking for the next big thing as the latest crisis experience wears off. Even in my own lifetime, says Mike Horton, I've witnessed 
and participated in a parade of radical movements. And now, according to Time magazine, the new Calvinism is one of the top trends changing the world. This movement has also been identified as young, restless, reformed. But as long as it is defined by youthful restlessness, it may tend to warp what it means to be reformed. And I agree, though I love those books. And I do love the change and the impact. More at home as an illustration, Mike Horton says, when they were younger fishermen, my children couldn't leave their line in the water long enough to catch a living thing. They were always reeling in the line to see if they had caught anything. Then, when they wanted to plant strawberries with my wife, their initial excitement turned quickly to boredom when, after only a few days, they didn't see any fruit. To be young is to be restless. We're lost in impatient wonder and selfish impulses but we are called repeatedly in the New Testament to grow up, to mature, to put away our childish ways. We are called to submit to our elders, to appreciate the wisdom that spans not only years but generations, and to realize that we do not have all the answers. We are not the stars in our own movie. If the whole apparatus of church life is designed by and for a youth culture, then we never grow up. And when I see what's happening in church culture, it is so aimed. I'm not talking about things that we can do better to address youthful issues. But I agree with him. We're never going to grow up. So in some ways, at least, our restless impatience with the ordinary is not just the influence of our culture, but the influence of unsound views of Christian discipleship that have shaped the culture over generations. Final page. First and foremost, as he tries to apply now, any renewed appreciation for the ordinary begins with God. Of course, God is hardly ordinary, but he delights in working in ordinary ways. Our triune God could do everything himself, directly and immediately. After all, he said, let there be light, and light appeared. Yet he also said, let the earth sprout vegetation, and the earth brought forth vegetation. God is no less the ultimate source of reality when he is working within creation to bring forth his purposes than he is in directly calling things into existence. In providence, God's ordinary way of working should surprise us with wonder. What could be more ordinary than the birth of a child? We do not call it a miracle to be astonished at God's handiwork. Or we do not have to. Even God's normal way of working is stupendous. Though the prophets and the apostles were called to an extraordinary office, they were ordinary people who communicated God's word in ordinary language. And we see this diversity even in incarnation. God becoming man. God's assumption of our flesh in the womb of a virgin is nothing short of a direct and miraculous intervention in history. And yet he assumed his humanity from Mary in the ordinary way, through an ordinary nine-month pregnancy, her delivery of the incarnation, God, incarnate God was not miraculous either. He even grew in ordinary ways, through ordinary means. As Luke would say, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. In addition, the, extra, the extraordinary miracle of new birth comes to us from above, but we are united to Christ through the ordinary preaching of the gospel. Some conversions are radical, others are gradual. In either case, it is God's miraculous work through the ordinary means of grace. In all these ways, God is the actor, even when he acts through creaturely means. We do not rise up to God, but he descends to us and communicates his grace to us through words and actions that we can understand. Ordinary does not mean mediocre. Athletes, architects, humanitarians, and artists can vouch for the importance of everyday faithfulness to mundane tasks that lead to excellence. But even if we are not headliners in our own various callings, it is enough to know that we are called there by God. So wherever you are, to maintain a faithful presence in his world, we look up in faith toward God and out toward our neighbors in love and good works. You don't have to transform the world to be a faithful mom or dad, sibling, church member, or neighbor. And who knows, maybe if we discover the opportunities of the ordinary, a fondness for the familiar, and a wonder for the mundane, 
we will end up being radical after all. Yes, indeed. Amen and amen. So, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. How do we get to Jesus from that verse? Fear. What does fear mean in the Bible? Who said it? Yes. Reverence, awe, trust, love, obey, enjoy, admire, devotion. It's what the heart does. Keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. And that is evidence of a heart that fears the Lord. It was Jesus who said, there is one wiser than Solomon here. I'm it. I'm it. It was Jesus who said, the whole Old Testament, the law and the prophets and the writings, they're all about me. And so when I look at Christ, Christ kept the commandments perfectly for me. Jesus is not just a role model. He's a savior who perfectly feared God and kept the commandments. He gave me his spirit to guide and equip and encourage the heart and mind to live, can we say it? The ordinary Christian life. When faced with temptation, Jesus turned to the word and quoted passages out of Deuteronomy. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is Jesus Christ who now satisfies this call for obedience. And it is my call, and it is a call upon me, it's a call upon every single Christian to fear God and commit and keep his commandments, for this is the wholeness of man, this is the management of man, this is the totality of your life, and if you think that pleasure, the pursuit of it, in and of itself, is, is, is big enough, is satisfying enough to give you meaning and purpose and safety and joy and peace in this life, you are headed down a disastrous path. Christ alone is the only thing that satisfies the heart. Now, go enjoy life. <laughs> and live your ordinary, mundane, blah, blah, blah life and put your back into it. And give it everything you've got to be just ordinary. Because you have no idea that all hell may break loose before midnight tonight upon your life. You don't know. But God does. Because God's above the sun, you see. And you and I are below. Hear the message of the preacher. Believe that Jesus Christ is your pleasure. Or pleasure will become your God and leave you empty. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you who know all things, you know what disasters are ahead of us. You know what joys are ahead of us. You have called us to trust you, to fear you, and to keep your commandments, which are summarized like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Give it everything you've got. Jesus Christ is not just simply your role model. He is your Savior. He will provide you everything you need. Now go and do the dishes without complaining. I thank you, Lord, for your word. How it liberates us from the lies that, this, that, this, that the culture, that the world flesh and the devil are constantly uh, offering to us. It is a lie 
to believe that life only has meaning if we are extraordinary. There is only one extraordinary person that ever lived on this planet, and his name is Jesus. So we'll keep our eyes upon you, Lord. Do what you think is best with our lives until one day we see you face to face in the sweet by and by. It's in Christ's name that we pray.